How might inhaled anesthetics affect the immune system? How might they alter our immune capacity, which is really a very complex phenomenon, as my wife will be happy to tell you, that involves both uh, leukocytes, macrophages, and uh, antibodies. It may involve um, the formation of DNA. Let's suppose you had some small molecules that could attack DNA directly. You think that could alter the immune system? Yeah, probably. I mean, in, in effect, that's what some of the chemotherapeutic agents do. Well, um, we don't have those with the inhaled anesthetics, with the possible exception of some of the breakdown products, like, like compound A. It could affect the immune system indirectly by interacting with uh, factors that lead to the production of immune products. Uh, it could affect the immune system by altering precursors. And we talked about that a little bit in our discussion of the inactivation of methionine synthesis by uh, nitrous oxide. There are some commonly used tests of mutagenicity. Anyone know what those are? The Ames test. The Ames test. Who, who's, who is Ames? Who's this fellow Ames? Anybody know? He's a professor of biochemistry at the University of California at Berkeley named Bruce Ames. And he was reading the contents of a bag of potato chips many, many years ago. And he said, you know, I, I got to thinking there are m more compounds in there than there are potatoes. And he said, I wonder, wonder what they would do to the, to the uh, mutagenicity what, are they mutagens? And he devised the Ames test to test that. It's a, a test of reversion of abnormal, of muta mutated Salmonella bacteria. And I won't go into the details of the test, but it is a standard test of mutagenicity, one that's applied to almost any new compound. A second is called the sister chromatid exchange test, where sister chromatids exchange DNA material. And if they exchange more, DNA material, it's thought that this may be an indication of mutagenicity. Are those affected by inhaled anesthetics? To our knowledge, no. To our knowledge, no. That's correct. You better say that louder. And what is it? To our knowledge, no. No, it's not. Now, anesthetics and surgery can also compromise the immune system in other ways. Uh, for example, the, the stress of surgery may increase uh, adrenal hormones. Or anesthetics may depress the oxidative burst uh, response of neutrophils to bacteria. And this is a slide showing uh, a test of that, showing the hydrogen peroxide production by neutrophils after stimulation with a bacterial peptide. Desferrin, isoflurane, and sevoflurane do not depress that response. Uh, the only anesthetic that does depress it happens to be Halothane. Whether that's of any importance or not, we're not really sure. We do know that uh, anesthetics such as desferrin can depress the febrile response to pyrogens. And we know that febrile response to pyrogens uh, can be an important part of the immune response. We know that controlled ventilation, controlled ventilation, which you all do every day, at high tidal volumes may have an adverse effect on the immune response, can increase the gene expression of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. And uh, it appears that sevoflurane is associated with less of this, less production than halothane or isoflurane. So sevoflurane, by this measure, may be a better anesthetic in terms of its effect on the immune system. And then there are autoimmune effects, effects that may relate to the toxicity of some compounds, particularly which compound? Halothane. Say it louder. Halothane. 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 What, what, how does this phenomenon take place? How does it happen? It sensitizes the hepatocytes um, 
and it forms like an autoimmune type reaction against the body's own hepatocytes. Right. And that occurs because what has happened to the hepatocyte? I believe it actually alters the cell membrane and the next time the person is exposed to um, halothane or something similar, um, it will have that autoimmune reaction. And the thing that reacts with the cell membrane or with the cell membrane proteins uh, that produces this autoimmune reaction is the trifluoroacetic portion of the halothane. You remember that halothane is a compound that is CF3, CCL, Br, H. And my friends would put the H over here rather than out there. And when halothane is metabolized, it's metabolized to CF3, COOH, trifluoroacetic acid, or some analog of that. And that oxidative metabolism leading to this, uh, that leads to a binding of this to the hepatic protein. The recognition of that altered hepatic protein as a foreign protein. The formation of antibodies to that protein, which then attack these as foreign substances and destroy the hepatocyte as a consequence. At least that's the theory. Are there other anesthetics that produce this trifluoroacetate? Isoflurane. Isoflurane. Desflurane. And desflurane. Why aren't they as hepatotoxic as halothane? Um, they're not metabolized nearly as much as halothane. So their met metabolic rate, their production of this, and the amount that's formed is much less. And there is recent evidence that one other compound may produce a similar reaction, but there is no clinical evidence that this is of any importance, and that's compound A. Compound A also may attach itself to hepatic proteins and may produce this response in animal models, but there's, as I say, no evidence for this in humans. Well, that finishes now this part of the book. We've now gone through some of the basic aspects of inhaled anesthetics, and what we're going to go on to next are some issues that relate to the effects of anesthetics on vital systems, on breathing, on circulation, and more.